Um, my collaborate, my contribution to board one is the painted backdrop. So much like a stage, stage in a theatre, we are making a backdrop. We're not making a gallery picture, and you will see some of that later. In the case of board one, we are making a bespoke likeness reminiscent of uh, a scene in Ingate Stone. Um, we use a backdrop to give the illusion of depth of field of more weld in brackets existing behind the model buildings. So why not just use the photographs? Um, there are two reasons. One is a clash of mediums. Your layout is mostly painted with sprays and brushwork strokes. You're painting in 4D extensively. A photo is a flat mechanical printed surface. Um, and you have to sort of realize as a camera mimics the human eye and it, it makes very convincing images like the way we perceive the world around us. So it, it is, you know, it is a kind of very different mechanical system to making an illusion. It's all an illusion. So photograph backdrops can be used, though, often to great effect on panoramic views. Um, the example I know is the layout in the picture, black country blues. So for the distant or panoramic view, Photoshop really has its uses. But Ingate Stone is a much more close quarters landscape. Its views are just behind trees or just over walls. And over the length of the layout, the backdrop curves. It's not a continuous flat backdrop like in the picture. So uh, here we go. So it's about positioning depictions of buildings, etc., on the backdrop relevant to the 4D structures on the front of the layout. Next slide. So what can we learn from old paintings? So here we have a fine realistic view of Delft in the late 1680s. So that we're looking at a Dutch townscape. We could be looking through a window in time, we, we would believe. We could quite easily cut the river part off and use the sky and townscape for a very nice backdrop for a model railway layout. Um, but the painting would cost us tens of millions of uh, dollars to buy, I'm, I'm assured. Um, oops. So, although it's a landscape, we in fact see little landscape in the picture. It's mostly sky because that is the total vista. As humans, we tend to focus on details in the view, not the total vista. So we are literally, we see everything in front of us, but we visually concentrate on what interests us. Uh, instinctively little animals we can eat. Um, so for most backdrops the sky is what is seen above your 4D structures in the foreground. So when you think when you take a picture of the signal box you've got sky above it and you want to kind of emulate that in your backdrop uh, to an extent. Um, in the painting most of the buildings are in profile and that's a more simple way of painting them. But your eye is drawn into the lighter, more distant town centre by the use of some simple perspective. The distant areas are lighter, less detailed and smaller. The sky is much the same with the darker cloud to the top or full sky. This heavy looking cloud not only gives depth, but it's key to the painting's approximate title, Delph After the Rain. Hence the wet slate roofs on the little castle structure. So this was the this is painting before the age of photography, and it is handmade illusion of reality rendered in oil paint. Not every course of brickwork is painted, or every tile, or every leaf on on every tree. It's all an effect of brushwork, often tiny dabs and dots of colour. It's almost impressionistic. Um, but Vermeer has created for his training and skills a very realistic work of illusion. Um, and that's the kind of fundamental difference between a mechanical means and a, a painted means. But it's, it's amazing, amazing. So the level crossing. 
So here we have part of the scene on board one, the level crossing taken from the viewpoint of either a little double O person or someone looking from the front edge of the board. So we are establishing or directing the viewers, um, the viewing point at which we are seeing the scene, um, which is sort of like you have to basically direct how you're going to look at the layout. Um, so we have a two foot deep board to cram in all these structures into a scale. And as you can see, the four foot eight span of the track is already eating into the available room. So building this scene fully at scale would require many more feet of board. So you compress space in the 4D modeled foreground. At the other end of the layout, we're compressing about a third of a mile into 10 foot, but that's another story. But we got lucky here on board one. The two small side roads provide a natural break in the landscape just behind our buildings. So our backdrop begins at where the road changes colour before going up the hill. So anything left or right of that point is on the backdrop. And this includes the large house that you cannot see behind the signal box. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm going to draw your attention to the large tree peeking out from behind the modern flats, from behind the little um, brick building. I'm going to come back to him later on. <laughs> Next picture, please. <laughs> here we go. Not the best photo, but Mr. Hedgehog is kindly lending a paw here. So we can just see the drawn out onto structures in this photo. The buildings are in their relative place and relationship to the structures on the front of the layout. So you've got to kind of line up where your buildings are behind your buildings on the layout, if you get my drift. The buildings are of a diminished height and scale to make them look distant. So you end up with this linear strip, not a nicely composed painting of a scene, but a back scene. So you have already put in, I've already put in some sky uh, the first version which was far too stormy and dramatic so that that had to go for this more passive sky with pale autumn colors of the far trees sketched in it's much like painting by numbers the filling in of the blocks of colors using artists acrylic water-based paint oil, oil paint being a much more involved medium um, and with its endless time that it takes actually to dry so acrylic paint is very good, it's, it's very quick. Uh, the Dutch painting was in oil, of course. So I've started to finalise the little houses down the lane in the woods, just to see how they're going to look. And, and that's on the left hand side there. So now we're at a much more blocked in stage. Most of the white has gone and we see the darker, more stronger colours in the foreground, like, like the view of Delft. So more trees and structures, structures in large objects being painted over the distant objects. So working, this is working at home under lockdown, but I needed to stop really at this point and see the backdrop back in its situation on board one, because as, as you paint, things move about a little bit. So the next picture. So on one of our socially distant sessions, I got the backdrop back to board one. Rob Stewart took this photo from the statutory two metres um, away. And what Rob first pointed out was the garage doors are too white and eye catching. They are bright white in reality, but for the purpose of the painted backdrop, they actually need to be toned down to a, a kind of pale grey. So that was one of the first apparent things. Um, so here we see the backdrop from the point of view of someone at Ali Pali behind the crowd barriers. Looking at the layout, we have to imagine the board populated with structures, trees and details, overhead line equipment and the trains moving, hiding most of what you see now. But that's the point of the backdrop. It's to be invisible, it's to be the background. So overall, I was happy with this first fitting. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you see that it comes to life. So this part of the backdrop does have some issues. 
but not as you may think in joining up the road with the level crossing in, in 4D. Um, this can be lined up with the backdrop and will be more visually interesting with a slight wiggle in it. And also the 4D road will be higher covering the meeting between backdrop and board and you can chamfer the material to soften, soften the join there. The problem is the modern flats. The second block needs to lose the story and height to force the illusion of perspective and depth. So you may remember I drew, drew your attention to the freaky large giant redwood behind the flats, not part of the Essex fauna and flora, I assure you. Well, it, it just will not look right. It does not look right in the composition of the backdrop. It's too big, too dramatic, and it, it spoils it. it. It breaks the back, the illusion of the backdrop. So far too distracting. So like many troublesome characters, it was painted out of history. The backdrop for Ingate Stone is a very bespoke job, um, as will all 30 plus feet of backdrop be. I mean, we've got quite an ambitious backdrop to cover um, on, on the layout. And um, when we return to Keen House, it, it would be nice to take this topic further, to have talks and demonstrations on how you achieve effective backdrop, simple tricks that you can apply to more freelance layouts, you know, where, where often uh, you can take a blue sky and put it behind a wall. But at, but at this point, I'll stop and thank you for your time and attention.